smile and say, I like you. All right. Let's get started here. Because <clears throat> I want to quit at eight or before. All right. Probably not before, but at least by eight. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me say something about, uh, uh, about uh, the Godhead. Look, we're all products of what we've been taught. And some things, uh, you know, religiously were handed down to us, and we have accepted that. And I understand that. I mean, my views on the end time changed, you know, um, I was taught a certain way, and I even as an evangelist preached it that way. And later in my evangelistic days, I started reading the Bible and saw it a different way. <laughs> but I had all the charts to prove it though, you know, I had all the pictures and charts to prove the first way. So I understand that we're all products of what we've been taught. And our understanding of some things has been a product of that. So, you know, when we talk about the Godhead, I can understand people's thinking certain ways and having that kind of understanding. And just like in, uh, in history, which we went over a little bit last time, I'm going to go over more tonight. You had two camps. You had the Arius camp and you had the Athanasius camp. The only problem with those two camps is that they were both wrong. And they were both in a minority. And so it wasn't a question of truth over error. You had two errors. And so one error was going to win out, and that's exactly what happened. But then that became codified, and it became indoctrinated, and it became a doctrine of the church. And so that's been handed down over the centuries. But as we, as we know, there are some things... <clears throat> that are, in, and let me just say something about religion. And I make a difference between religion and Christianity. Now, Christianity can become a religion in some people's minds, but religion is about control. Religion is, is, uh, is about rules and regulations only. Religion is about you earning your way to whatever the salvation is that is preached. Right. Now, that's different than what the Bible actually... Now, when we use the term religion, I understand, I understand the general concept of that, the use of that word. I'm talking about in a technical sense, religion is destructive. Yeah. But a relationship with Jesus Christ is living. And it's an organism. It's alive. It's like a body. It has relationships. Where religion can be cold and hard and facts and um, um, about rules and regulations and rituals and unscriptural doctrines that have been handed down through the centuries. Uh, one such one just came out this, uh, this, uh, this, th just this week. Now, for the last thousand years, the Roman Catholic Church has made it a doctrine that its priests and its nuns do not marry. They practice celibacy. And it's been a doctrine of the church. Well, Pope Francis just came out a few days ago and said he thinks he's going to overturn that to where Catholic priests and nuns can marry. But it's been a doctrine of the church for over a thousand years. So what is truth? Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And just like we pointed out last week, you have all kinds of doctrines that were implemented hundreds of years beyond the New Testament church that became, they became first they started off as a tradition or a statement, and then they became a doctrine. And what happened with many of these things, and if you look at church history, if you did not follow and toe the line, 
you are called a heretic and you're going to get burned at the stake. So there was no tolerance for any questioning of the hierarchy in religion. Now, if you fast forward to about the 1400s and John Knox and uh, John Wycliffe, who were both burned at the stake for simply translating the scripture in the modern tongue. And then Martin Luther came along and he said, the just shall live by faith. And then you had what you saw from the Renaissance time or the new age of, or the age of enlightenment, you saw a restoration bit by bit, line upon line of New Testament truth. How many know here today that it's not religious tradition that should be doctrine? We find our doctrine in the word of God. That's why you will see this repeated phrase by the Apostle Paul and the other apostles who wrote. They all talk about sound doctrine. So, you know, it's like, it's like the Word of God says, let every man be a liar, but let God be true. So when we think about our obedience, and, and look, our, our understanding of the Scripture and our understanding of truth is progressive. It, it's like, it's like, you know, I went to Sunday school. I knew this much about God. But I knew as much as I could handle at that point. Yeah. But as I grow and develop even in the natural and as I grow in knowledge and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, my understanding of truth should be deeper and clearer. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And so by, by thinking about it in those terms... I've known a lot of people in my time who said, okay, I, I've, uh, uh, I, under, I understood God this way, and uh, now, now I, uh, I, I, I understand him differently. I'm looking for some... Hey, Jared... Give me the papers that are in the side of your notebook because I forgot to put them in my... I, I, I changed notebooks and I didn't get that there. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you just how things can change and that man, man-made doctrines can get in the way of truth. Thank you. Um, So it's important, for, it's important. A, lot, a lot of these that I've showed you up here happened hundreds of years after uh, even the begin, after the New Testament church. And they began, co- began to be codified and, and then became doctrines. One, one of these is the doctrine and the mode of baptism. I'm going to read, I didn't put these on slides because there's too many and I can read it a lot quicker, Okay. So you just put your ears on. Let, 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 let me show, share, share with you. This is going to tell you why, and, and this has something to do with the oneness of the Godhead or, or, and the Trinity. Um, what, what I'm going to read to you is statements, even out of Catholic uh, encyclopedias, the Britannica Encyclopedia, um, and a lot of other sources that show us how and tell us plainly how the mode of water baptism was changed from the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is what the early church practiced, okay, to in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which came almost 400 years after the early church was founded. And then how it got handed down as a doctrine of the church and that any other, any other thinking about that or any other quoting of scriptures was forbidden and could not be on, 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 on the sake of your life. So there, there are things, all I'm saying is that no, how many here has ever been taught church history? Nobody. Nobody's taught church history. We don't know how we got to where we are and why there's almost 2,000 different denominations because we don't know our church history. We don't know how things came to be. We were taught these things. 
you know, we look through the Bible and say, well, we don't, I, don't find, I, I, I don't find the doctrine of transubstantiation in the Bible, but, you know, that's the way I was taught. How many know tradition gets in the way of truth? You know, we get, we get, all of us can get caught up in traditions and rituals and things that we, we were taught and, uh, and uh, bless God and, and high water, we're going to hold to it regardless of what the Bible says. I, I, I remember one person I was talking to him and I, 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 I referred them to a particular passage. He said, well, they said they don't read that passage. And I said, ask them why? Because they said they don't agree with it. So I uh, reached into my pocket, sitting behind my desk, I reached into my pocket and I brought out my little pen knife I always carry. I opened it up and I handed it to them and they said, what's that for? I said, well, I just want you to take out your Bible and I want you to cut out everything you don't agree with. <gasps> you thought I would committed blasphemy. I said, that's what you're doing intellectually. Yes. You're approaching the Word of God and things you don't like or things you don't agree with you are intellectually taking your knife and cutting out that part of the scripture you don't want like. Look, the scripture is very clear. We're not to add to the word of God and we're not to take away. Look, God knows what he's saying. Now, the issue is that our understanding of it is not as clear as it could be. Paul said it well. We see through a glass darkly. We only know in part. We only prophesy in part. But if we really want that, when people ask me about water baptism, I always say the same thing. I want you to go home. I want you to, re I want you to look up every reference concerning water baptism. And then I want you to come back and let's talk about it. I want you to know what the Bible says about it. Not what some tradition or denomination or some creed or something that's hanging on the wall says about it. I want you to know what the Bible says about it. Then we'll get, we'll get back together and then we can talk about it. Now we have a basis to talk about it. And um, uh, that's it. So let me, let me read you. This is water baptism, Britannica's Encyclopedia, which I referred to uh, last week. 11th edition. You can't find that edition anymore, but it's still on the, it, it, you still have references to it on the internet. Volume 3, page 365, 366. This, and, and the Britannic Encyclopedia is, is, is owned by the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, the baptismal, this is what they say, the baptismal formula was changed from the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost by the Catholic Church in the second century. They admit to doing it. You've got to ask yourself the question, why? Did you not think the Word of God was good enough? You got the new and improved version for yourself? Britannica Encyclopedia, Volume 3, page 82. Everywhere in the oldest sources, it states that baptism took place in the name of Jesus Christ. Caney, Encyclopedia of Religion, page 53. The early church always baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus until the development of the Trinity doctrine in the second and third century. That ought to tell you something. <clears throat> Catholic Encyclopedia, volume two, volume 2, page 263. Here the Catholics acknowledge that baptism was changed by the Catholic Church. Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion, volume 2, page 377. Christian baptism was administered using the words in the name of the Lord Jesus. Volume 2, Page 378. The use of a Trinitarian formula of any sort was not suggested in the early church history. Volume 2, page 389. Baptism was always in the name of the Lord Jesus until the time of Justin Martyr when the, tri uh, when the triune, uh, uh, when Justin Martyr, one of the early church fathers, suggested a triune formula. Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion, volume 2, 377. On Acts 2.38, name was an ancient synonym for person. Payment was always made in the name of the person referring ownership. Therefore, one being baptized in Jesus' name became his personal property. You are Christ. New International Encyclopedia, volume 22, 477. The term Trinity was originated by Tertullian, a Roman Catholic church father. 
Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, 1951, page 384, 389. Formula was used was in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or some synonymous phrase. There is no evidence for the use of a triune name. The earliest form represented in Acts was simple immersion in water, the use of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the laying on of hands. These were were addendum at various times and places which cannot safely be identified as far as the triune name. Interpreter's Bible of the Bible. The evidence suggests that the baptism in the early Christianity was administered not in a threefold name, but in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You want more evidence? History of Christian thought. 1965, page 53, at first baptism was administered in the name of Jesus, but gradually in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Hastings Dictionary of the Bible, 1898, page 241. One explanation is that the original form of words was into the name of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism into the name of the Trinity was a later development. History of the Christian Church, the New Te- page 435, 1957. The New Testament knows only baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, which still occurs even into the second and third centuries. Well, the truth of the matter is it always has occurred, but it wasn't written about because no other, no other doctrine was tolerated because it was considered heresy. Caney's Encyclopedia of Religion, 1970, page 53. Persons were baptized at first in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or in the name of the Lord Jesus. Afterwards, with the development of the doctrine of the Trinity, they were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Encyclopedia Biblica, 1899, page 473. It is natural to conclude that baptism was administered in the earliest times in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or in the name of the Lord Jesus. This view is confirmed by the fact that the earliest forms of baptismal confession appear to have been single, not triple, as was later the creed. Encyclopedia Britannica, one more, 11th edition, 1910, page 365. The Trinitarian formula and triune immersion was not uniformly used from the beginning of baptism. Baptism was in the name of the Lord Jesus and was the normal formula in the New Testament. In the third century, baptism in the name of Christ was still so widespread that Pope Stephen, in opposition to Cyprian of Carthage, declared it to be valid. So that is historical evidence of people who over the, uh, through time have, have looked at, at uh, church history. They've looked at the practice of the early church and they have acknowledged and admitted that the mode of baptism and the name that was used was changed. Now, having said all that, most people don't know what I've just read to you. You may be hearing that for the exact, for the very first time. And uh, you, you uh, um, have done what you thought was best and what you were instructed to do. And I understand that. But here's what I tell people who, who uh, come to me with questions. I said, you know, the real issue is what are you going to do with present truth? That, that's the real issue. I, 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 you know, whatever grandma and grandpa did, we're going to leave that up to God because he judges righteously and he knows their heart, okay? We can't stand in any kind of judgment. But, but when, when clarity comes to me, when clarity comes to me from the scriptures, the real issue is what am I going to do with it? It doesn't matter what anybody else does. Am I going to, un, am I going to follow uh, truth? So let's, let's delve into this real quick. And, you know, if you have a question, write it down. I will address it. Because I know there's going to be a lot of questions, although I'm going to try to clear this up to where you have a little clearer understanding. And like I said, look, if, if people do not have a clear understanding of the Godhead, um, I, don't, I don't believe that that in and of itself affects anybody's salvation. Um, I know Trinitarians, most Trinitarians can't explain it, and many oneness can't explain it either. 
So, uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain it. Okay, I'm gonna clear it all up, and it'll be it'll be easy. I really it will. You'll 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 get a handle on it. And you know, my take on it is: look, I don't. For me, I don't have to get off into okay. It was like I went to a, I went to a, a, a in high school. I went to a, one of my best friends in high school, who was a Trinity, a Trinity Pentecost. So he invited me to a revival, and so I went with him. We're sitting there. We sang a chorus. And the pastor gets up and he says, okay, we just sang that for God the Father. Now we're going to sing it two more times. We're going to sing it once for God the Son and we're going to sing it for God the Holy Ghost. So we sang the chorus two more times. But then, strange of all strange, he said, now, let's worship the Lord. We just sang a song, once for the Father, once for the Son, and once for the Holy Ghost. Now we're going to worship the Lord. Okay, now which one? And the Holy Ghost gets left out most of the time. So what I want us to do is, is look, cl clear it up in your thinking and in your mind so that when you honor the Lord, you know exactly what's going on. Okay? And that's, that's my whole purpose in doing this, it is not it is not to bring any judgment or condemnation on anybody. It's to bring clarity to our understanding. Amen? All right, let's do this. A quarrel arose, I told you, in about 300 AD concerning the divinity of Christ. Arius said that Christ was not divine, and Athanasius declared that he was. The quarrel became so intense, and the council was convened in 325 AD at Nicaea, to settle this issue because Constantine, who was the emperor, knew that to have a unified religion was very important to the cohesiveness of the empire. <clears throat> so he was a pagan. He declared himself bishop of the church, overseer of the church. He called all the bishops together from everywhere, and he oversaw this debate. And then he came up with the formula, the formula known as the Apostles' Creed. He's the one, he says, and he wanted to satisfy everybody on both sides. And when they got through, both sides were a minority. The majority of people did not agree with any of this. So look, Athanasius argued against Arius for a trinity of divinities and would not allow any other opinion, was ruthless in his branding of, of anything that was a heresy. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Okay, um, let me see. Where's Josh? Okay. Uh, well, uh, Jared, come on up here then. There's, I added some things and he downloaded off of a thumb drive and I put it on the iCloud. I put it on the iCloud, pastor's iCloud. Pull that up and pull up that one. Um, I'll read it to you and then we'll, we'll show you the, 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 the slide here. When it came to the Nicene Council, 325 AD, the Encyclopedia Britannica states, Constantine, guiding the discussions and personally proposed the crucial formula expressed the relationship of Christ to God in the creed issued by the council. It's under the iCloud, uh, Josh. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you that. Uh, I've updated my slides. Overall, by the, uh, the emperor, the bishops, with two exceptions only, signed the creed, many of them much against their inclination. And that's a 1971 edition, page 386. In other words, a lot of the bishops didn't agree with it, but they, you know, here's the emperor. You know, he, can, he holds in his hand your life and death. And so they signed the Apostles' Creed even though they did not agree with it. The emperors, with the emperor's approval, the council rejected the minority view of Arius and having nothing definitive with which to replace it, approved the view of Athanasius. Also a minority view. The church was left in the odd position of officially supporting 
From that point forward, the decision made of the, at Nicaea to endorse the belief held by only a minority view of Athanasius. So here's what happened. Out of this council came a, a written document and statement that basically started the viewpoint of a triune God. And it became the official position of the church at that time, even though a majority, the groundwork for official acceptance of the Trinity was now laid, but it took more than three to five centuries after Jesus Christ's death and resurrection for this unbiblical teaching to emerge. The Council of Nicaea did not end the controversy. Karen Armstrong explains Athanasius managed to impose his theology on the delegates with the emperor breathing down their necks. So what you have is an enforced document and position that a minority of Christians uh, viewed, but it was implemented and codified. The show of agreement uh, pleased Constantine, who had no understanding of theological issues, but in fact there was no unanimity at Nicaea. After the council, the bishops went on teaching as they had before, and the Arian crisis continued for another 60 years. Arius and his followers fought back and managed to regain imperial favor. Athanasius was exiled no fewer than five times, and it was very difficult to make the creed stick. That, and that's in uh, page 110 and 111. Now, these are historical facts. But again, I understand we were never taught church history. We were never taught how things came to be. We were never taught how certain doctrines of the church, uh, certain traditions of the church became doctrines that became heaven and hell issues for people that, were, that had no biblical basis whatsoever. So I understand the confusion and I understand how people can come to certain understand and, and understanding and thinking about it. Because we have nothing else to depend on. And that's what happened back then. They began to push a creed that had no biblical basis, and yet that was what was formulated and pushed. The ongoing disagreements were at times violent and bloody. Of the aftermath of the Council of Nicaea, noted historian Will Durant writes, probably more Christians were slaughtered by Christians in these two years 42 to 43, than by all the persecutions of the Christians by pagans in the history of Rome. The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, 1950, page 8. Atrocities, while claiming to be a Christian, many believes, believers fought and slaughtered one another over their different views of God. Now, now you, now, now you know why some pagans will not be attracted to Christianity because of this junk, yeah. this stuff. So what you have to understand is that during this time, there was a push by the mainstream church at that time, which is Roman Catholic. And Catholic means universal. Roman means where it's from. That any other thinking and any other teaching would be met with death. And you see that for the next 1,000 years where any dissent or anybody reading, it, it's, it's, no, it's no different than in Canada today. You could read a passage from the Bible on the street corner and be arrested for it and put in jail. Why? Because they don't like what it says. We're quickly coming to a place in North America and the world where free speech is no more. This is what you had back then. Any free speech or any other independent thought or reading even passages that conflicted with the statement of the church at that point would be considered heresy and we have to stamp it out and, and we will execute you. This is what happened. Professor Rye also cited earlier, writes, in the second half of the fourth century, three theologians from the province of Cappadocia in Eastern Asia Minor, today Central Turkey, 
gave definitive shape to the doctrine of the Trinity, page 65. They proposed an idea, you see that right there? They proposed an idea that was a step beyond Athanasius' view. See, now Athanasius never, he, he used the term Trinity, but he never used the term persons. They took it a step beyond Athanasius' view that God, uh, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit were co-equal and, and together in one being, yet also distinct from one another. That didn't come until hundreds of years after the New Testament. Why? Because the New Testament church never taught that. Right. This is something that developed over time, and I understand most people don't know that. They think this is the way the early church always taught it, and it's not. There were things that were put into place that had no biblical basis. These men, Basil, Bishop of Caesarea, his brother Gregory, Bishop of Nysa, Nysa and Gregory of Nysa, whatever his name is, were all trained in Greek philosophy, Armstrong 113, which no doubt affected their outlook and beliefs. See Greek philosophy. Now, what they're talking about here about Greek philosophy, Greek philosophy always had a triune God. You just have to go back and look it up in the encyclopedia. Almost all pagan religions have some form of a triune God that they worship. In fact, it goes back even as far back as the Tower of Babel. Yes, amen. You ever read the, man by the, man, the man's name by Nimrod? Yeah. There, was a, there was a study that was done on Babylon. Uh, it's called the Two Babylons. And it, it, it uh, historically uh, points out that, see, Nimrod, Nimrod was, uh, and his mother were deified along with the father. And they had images of the mother and son all the way back at the Tower of Babel yes. of worship of mom and son. So it, it was not new in Greek philosophy that a lot of the pagan religions and understanding had a triune or tritheistic kind of, of God. And uh, that many Christians use Trinitarian, and this is important, I want you to understand. Many people use Trinitarian language that do not believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. I believe that. I've talked to many. Yep. They'll use the terminology because that's all they've heard. Yes. They don't know any different. That's all they've been taught. It, and, but I'll tell you that the doctrine of the Trinity is an assumed doctrine. It's never a taught one. And I'll tell you why later. Yet come back. <laughs> okay. Because that's the only language and the words that they have heard all their lives and do not know what the Trinity Doctrine actually says. And so I have met many, many people who will use that terminology that do not believe in the Trinity. Um, I tell the story. <laughs> Young and dumb evangelist. Me, I was in uh, Lafayette, Louisiana, and I was holding a revival there. And I was also teaching sign language and establishing a ministry for the deaf. I asked the pastor if I could go to a local church in the city because they had a deaf ministry just to see what they had. So he gave me off Sunday morning. I went over there. The people that were directing over the deaf ministry, very kind, very gracious. I went through the service, and like a lot of Southerners would do, they invited me home for dinner. And so I'm sitting at the table, and the man sits across the table, and he asks me, he says, well, t tell me, what's the difference between us and you? And young and dumb, I said to him, I said, well, I, I, I think probably... One of the main issues is that you believe in a, in a triune God. We don't. We baptize in Jesus' name. You baptize in the titles. He says, when I said about the triune God, he said, we don't believe that. I said, yes, you do. <laughs> I said, you know, when you get to heaven, how, it's, it says, uh, one that sits on the throne. I said, how many, how many are you going to see? He says, one. I said, you don't believe that. He says, yes, I do. I said, well, who is it you're going to see? He says, 
the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, you don't believe that. He says, yes, I do. <laughs> so that's why I say a lot of people have used terminology that's not biblical because that's all they've known. That's all they've been told. That's all they've been taught. And they don't really believe the doctrine of the Trinity as stated. Because I, I'm going to show you how that doesn't make sense whatsoever. And it certainly doesn't make biblical sense. So let's, let's look at this here. We need to define our terms. If you don't define the terms, okay, we've got a few more minutes. If you don't define the terms, then things can mean whatever you want it to mean. And you can manipulate it to where, it is. so we want to look at what the actual, and I've, I've looked at about 50 different sites on the explanation of the term. They all basically say the same thing. And there's a couple things they leave out, which I'm going to tell you next week. That, that, that's in the Bible that they completely ignore. Here it says, the term Trinity does not appear in the Bible. Go search it. You'll never find it. That was a later development doctrine that came out of the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD that Emperor Constantine determined and oversaw with the outcome of what is known as the Written Apostles' Creed. And then over the next 150 so years, in 500 AD, became known formally as the Athanasius Creed. He was dead, but he still had his followers. As the Athanasius Creed, or a trinity, or a tri, they use this word, triunity of God. Now, here's, here's what it says. Webster's Dictionary, New International Dictionary, defines the trinity in this way. The condition of being three, or threeness. Theological, the union of three persons are a hypostasis, which means essence of the same order. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, in one Godhead, so that all three are one God as to substance, but three distinct persons are essence as to individuality. Now that's the definition from, uh, from the International Dictionary. Um, here is the form they use. You can't see these little things right here. But here up here is Father, Son, Holy Spirit that make up one God. Do you see this? And they'll say Son is God, Holy, Holy Spirit is God, Father is God. That's, that's all correct at that point. Uh, but here's what they say. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. And the Son is not the Father. And that's, that's basically the visual that they will use almost in every article that you will come across. That is the visual. Here's another one that they use. What is the Trinity? The Father is not the Son. Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not that. Uh, but they're all God, and they make one God. Uh, uh, and here's what they say. There's certainly only one God and Creator, uh, the God of Israel. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And we're, we're good right here. The Father is eternal. The Son is eternal. The Holy Spirit is eternal. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. There are three, and here's the, here's the hitch right here. This is the key. These are three distinct persons. Now, I'm just going to give you a little hint. Tell me somebody how the Holy Spirit can be a person. Just explain that to me rationally. We'll get to that later. But that's just a little, cue, that's a little cue of how mixed up doctrine can become over centuries that are formulated by man that make absolutely no sense and make no biblical sense. And, and therefore, it gets incorporated. It gets handed down from generation to generation. And, uh, and, and so people can become confused as to what's going on. Okay. These three distinct persons are derived from scriptures by, and here I'm, I'm quoting all this from papers and uh, uh, chapters and things from, from uh, a Trinitarian standpoint. They say these three distinct persons are derived from scriptures by what? They say it's implied. It's not stated. It's just implied. 
Well, how many know that people can imply a lot from the scriptures <laughs> that are not biblical? And that's what happens. They, 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 they think it implies it. So the Trinity or triunity states that there are three distinct persons, and there's the key uh, that we, ob we object to in the Godhead, and they are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you that God the Son and God the Holy Ghost are not biblical terms? You will never find them in the scriptures. You'll find it nowhere referenced whatsoever. And so these are the, the, the Trinity and God the Son and God the Holy Ghost are not biblical terms. And they say they're co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent. Now I'm going to talk about this aspect here when I get to the oneness, about uh, the Son being, uh, about all these things being co-equal. And let me just give you, they'll use the term begotten of the Father. Well, let me ask you, what does begotten mean? So they're telling you they've always been on one hand, and on the other hand, the Scripture says, the only begotten of the Father, which means Christ had a beginning. And I'm going to talk about the preexistent state of Christ, what that means, and you, you, it'll, it'll all clear up for you. A couple more things here. Note, the apostles did not refer to God as three distinct persons, nor did they teach uh, or refer to a trinity or a triunity. Never once mentioned. And you would think that the apostles, neither did the church fathers make no mention of a trinity in the Godhead, nor did they write or refer, refer to God in this way. So you had the first generation, which was the apostles. You had the church fathers, which were taught by the apostles. And they did extensive writing and record keeping. None of these apostles or church fathers ever used the term even Trinity. Um, uh, and they didn't, refer, they didn't refer to any of that. So we need to ask ourselves if there was not, if there was a question about this, why were the apostles and the church fathers not addressing it? If there was a question in anybody's mind, why did it take 300 years to 500 or 600 years to formulate the doctrine of the Godhead because everybody was confused. People didn't know who Jesus was. They didn't know who God was. They didn't know who anybody was. And it took 500 years after Jesus' death for it to be codified and, and quote, maybe understood. That makes no biblical or rational sense. The apostles didn't address it. The church fathers did not address it. And you have to ask yourself, why, why was the silence? There are three terms that describe God. Number one, God is omnipotent, means he's all-powerful. Right? God is omniscient, means he's all-knowing. God is omnipresent, means he's everywhere. Now let that sink in. He's everywhere. There's not a place he's not. There's not nothing he doesn't know. And there's not the, nothing that he cannot do. He's omniscient, he's om, uh, omnipresent, and he's omnipotent. Now, I'm going, to end, I'm going to end with this. Which of the following formula represents the trinity or the triunity of God as stated in their doctrinal belief? I've got up here, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. It's either one-third plus one-third plus one-third equals one God. Or it's one plus one plus one equals one God. Which, which one do you think is the correct formula that Trinitarians stand on? Anybody care to guess? Which one? <laughs> They're both wrong. But see, Trinitarians don't say that one-third, 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 one-third equals one. Now, that would make, to me, rational sense, right? You don't have to have a degree in math to know that a third plus a third plus a third equals one. But you do have to have the new math to believe this one. One plus one plus one equals one. Now, any first grader knows one plus one plus one doesn't equal one. 
So if you show a, if you show a first grader the doctrine of the Trinity, here's one, here's the second one, and there's the third one. How many is that? They're going to say it's three. No, it's one. That's new math. See, you thought new math was new. It goes way, way back. <laughs> it goes way, way back. So here, here's, here's the point that you want to take away after, at this session. That look, there were teachings that came into the church that became doctrinalized that have no biblical basis and yet were handed down from generation to generation to where it became codified. People use the language. They have kind of the understanding. And yet, let me, let me say, let me just ask you this. The God who wanted to manifest himself to mankind and show himself to, to man, do you think he wouldn't have stated it clearly? Who he is? And he did in the scriptures. And I'll show you why. God wants to reveal himself to us. You know, I don't, I don't have to get into, okay, am I saying hallelujah to Jesus a little more than I'm saying glory to God? And where does the Holy Ghost fit into this? Uh, if they're distinct persons. And there's the key. There's the unbiblical term, persons. That's the unbiblical term. And yet it's been handed down, down through time to where we have people, people are confused. <laughs> I've talked to a lot of people. People are just confused. So let me end with this. Article Trinity from the Encyclopedia Standard Bible Encyclopedia, James Orr, General Ed Editor, pages 3012 to 3022, published Chicago, uh, Howard Severance, uh, 1915. Here's what they say about the Trinity. Not what I say, what they say about the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is based upon the principle and a sense of Scripture and unbiblical language can be justified only that it is better to preserve the truth of Scripture than the words of Scripture. Now, how conflicting is that statement? that you have to read into the Bible and decipher what the truth is over what was actually said. That's what this statement is saying. And he goes on, they go on to say the Trinity lies in Scripture in solution. That means ultimate outcome. Not in formulated de definition. In other words, it's not specifically stated. You can't find it anywhere. It's an implied doctrine. But in fragmentary allusions, when who assembles? We. we. Man. We start putting it together. We start assembling it together. We start saying this is what it means. We start reading into it. We start the implications. We say that the words of the scripture are not as important as what we think it means. <laughs> and that's where the unity comes in. We are not passing from Scripture, but entering into the meaning of it. Well, who's defining the meaning? You have to ask yourself. You know, my Bible tells me that all Scripture is, of, uh, is profitable for doctrine, and it is of no private interpretation. Interpretation. In other words, you let the Bible tell you what the Bible means. And it will tell you what it means. So, uh, the, what I've given you here is all documentation from uh, the doctrine of the Trinity as it is totally taught. And I dare say that 
Anybody who ever uses Trinitarian language knows what the doctrine of the Trinity actually states. They don't know that. And they get confused. I understand that. And if you go to the Bible thinking there's a Trinity, you'll find it. Because you already have a presupposition that it's there. But if you go to the Bible, and let me just say, and I'll pray. Do you know why Jews are against Christianity? It's that doctrine right there. Because here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And they cannot fathom a triune God. So they reject Christianity. It's over that single piece. We're going to clear this up. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. We do ask for your direction, your insight, your understanding. Lord, we, we love you. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. You are our friend. You are the fullness of us. We ask, Lord, that you use us for your glory. Let tomorrow night's youth rally be a time of Holy Ghost outpouring. As we gather Sunday, pour out your spirit upon our church family. Let us be used of you between now and then. And let your power and your Holy Spirit be upon us in a great way. Give us insight and understanding. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have a question, write it down. You can type it up anonymously. You Whatever you want to do, that'll be fine. God bless you.